Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 56, we're going to take a look at harmonics and why they're so important. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, last week I talked briefly about harmonics in relation to the Yuri Monoblock kit amp. And this week we're going to go a little deeper into understanding harmonic distortion. In all types of amplifiers, but particularly with vacuum tubes, we naturally get something called harmonic distortion. For a long time I've contended that this is one of the main differences between a good sounding tube and a flat sounding tube. The harmonics that we like are even order, and the ones we don't like are odd order. Don't ask me why this is, it's just the way it is. Some people have contended that in nature we mostly have even order harmonics. So that's why we find them pleasant. Now, this sounds complicated, but it's not, so hang on for a bit longer. If our fundamental frequency is 1000 Hz or cycles, and we've just, we've just plucked a frequency out of, out of the thin air. <laughs> Anyways, 1000 Hz or cycles, it's the same thing, which is at the very top of the mid-range or the very bottom of the treble. The second order harmonic is two times 1000 or 2000 Hz. The third is 3000 and the fourth is 4000. And the fourth is the next even harmonic, so we like that, but not the third at 3000 Hz. Now, why is this even important, and what the heck, Jim, I'm not having much fun with this number thing. The reason it's important is tubes and tube amps that fill in the even harmonics can sound wonderful with certain types of music. Anything acoustic or vocal benefits from the addition of even harmonics. Some bigger styles, like rock and roll and orchestral, sometimes sound better and sometimes not. Now, an example of sometimes sounding better is quite a bit of the Rolling Stones um, music is actually very acoustic. And, um, and that, I guess that's partly because they have a fairly strong leaning towards country and the blues and... As a result, uh, when I was listening to one of the one of the '70s albums that's been remastered, it's the one that starts off with "Sympathy for the Devil." I couldn't believe how good it sounded, and much of the Stones catalog was not well recorded and just does not sound good. But this remastering job, it it, and with um, tube gear that emphasized a little bit of more of the second harmonic. In fact, this is all these were all kit amps that I was playing it on. In fact, the preamp was the 6 or 12 SN7. And let's take a look at that. Now, this is, this is the full frequency plot. So, it's a sweep. And that means that we've sent through uh, all of the frequencies. In this case, uh, we sent through... We actually sent through t 10 hertz, but we've only plotted 20. And um, so we've plotted 20 all the way up to um, way over here I think that's I think that's 10 and I think over here it's 20k anyways it doesn't matter um, the thing that matters is that what are what are we talking about so way up here this is the fundamental so this is the full frequency spectrum all the way across here and it's a nice flat line, as you can see, which is what you want in a frequency response. You don't want this thing going up and down. And down here, this is the second order. Now, it's way down. Let's find it here on the list. Second order harmonic is at minus 52.1 dB relative to the fundamental signal, which is up here. We set it at zero so that we could get a relative reading on the signal. So that's a, that minus 52 dB is a long way down. And further down we see all the other harmonics. Here's the third order harmonic and that's sort of in this punk it's sort of a light brown color. Uh, 
I guess it's orange. It's hard to see. Anyways, you see it in here. It's buried in the noise floor. And it's a little spiky up here. And we've got a nasty little spike at 120 hertz. And a smaller one at 60, which is pretty normal. This is this is your your mains and this is the B plus or on the secondary side of the power supply. Um, so this is before we we uh, we started to we started to adjust the filtering. Now let's look at what the final um, what the final plot looks like. This is the actual plot for the 6 or 12 SN7 preamp kit uh, as it's going to go out to customers. So up here we have our fundamental. So this is the full frequency spectrum. When we put in our filtering, we wanted to get the noise floor even further, particularly this 120 hertz spike. But this is the important thing to note. We wanted to keep as much of the second uh, harmonic as possible. So it drops slightly. Let's find it here. It's now at 55.8, minus 55.8 decibels. And at the same time, we are able to drop significantly. The no this is the noise floor right here. And this is the, all these different colors are all the various harmonics. Now the total harmonic distortion, the THD, is a normal spec that you'll see with any kind of audio gear, amplifiers, preamps, and it gets set at minus 55.7. So let's take a look at the second order harmonic. It's minus 55.8. So that, as far as THD is concerned, that's the noise floor. But in reality it's not, is it? This is really the noise floor it's at minus 79.4. This is it right here because this second harmonic we consider to be beneficial. We actually want to hear that a little bit. Even at this reduced level of volume compared to the fundamental, we can still hear this. Now it's going to be fairly faint and very subtle, which is what we want. But this second order harmonic, it brought this preamp alive. In an earlier version, this was greatly reduced, the noise floor was lower, and by bringing up and changing the filtering a little bit, we were able to get and take an amp basically that sounded, it sounded really good, it sounded very clean, but it wasn't alive, um, it wasn't musical, and it, it just wasn't turning us on at all. Um, and uh, when, we, when we went and started looking deep into the um, the frequency analysis and I started playing around with the filtering we very quickly realized that we much preferred the second harmonic somewhere around here but we also wanted to suppress all this noise way down here and the third harmonic which we don't want to hear this is it right here have a look at it it's buried way down here it is at minus 83.9 so that's fabulous. We've got all this miscellaneous junk that we don't want to hear way down where you, you, even if you turn your preamp up to maximum, you can just barely hear a very small noise floor. Okay, well hopefully that helped explain harmonics a little bit. And before we go, let's take a look at some really lovely tubes that came in this week. Let's get this off the table. A whole bunch of my favorite EL34s. One of my favorite. I have I have about three or four of them actually. But the Mullards, I adore Mullard sound. Uh, the XF2s is my specialty. And it takes an awful lot of tubes to get a match quad. It's just the way it is. Even when power tubes are made brand new at the factory. Even a quality manufacturer like Mullard Blackburn plant uh, with years of experience making the XF2, the, the, uh, the amount of output of the tube varied considerably off the, off the line. And as a result, the tubes had to be, they had to be tested and they had to be matched. Now, some 
At some point, manufacturers actually started selling match pairs, match quads, certified match quads, things like that. Um, but in most cases, it was actually the tube retailer that would do the matching. And they would do that on a custom power tube matcher. I have one that I, that I built, and uh, it's in constant use. It's indispensable. Anyways, the, there'll be some more match quads in the store. It seems like as fast as I can match up quads. This is, um, have a look here. This is slightly rare. The, these are the double O getters. And they just overlap slightly in the middle. The more common single O getter, um, is th they're still expensive tubes, but these um, get a they, they get a premium price, they sell, wholesale they sell for a premium price, and it, it's just, they're, they're just not that common. I, some, some days I find, I find a bunch of these and I, I count my blessings and I'll be able to match up more quads, but it seems as soon as I get a quad of uh, mullards in the store, somebody is buying them. They're a very high demand tube. What else came in? Oh, have a look at these. This is one of my top three or four 6SL7s. This is a 1940s or 50s uh, Sylvania. This is the mil-spec version. It has a black plate. There's a regular consumer version that had the gray plate. But you can tell, of course, the black plate gives it away. But you can, if you can read the, the label, it's a Jan Joint Army Navy CHS 6SL7GT or VT229. Now, the V2... VT229, that is just the military designation for the mil-spec 6SL7, so it's, this, it's the same thing. But these are just lovely sounding 6SL7s. If they're in good shape, and many of them aren't, they'll have a decent amount of chrome at the waist, and it's absolutely critical to electrically test them. Many of them don't get through that to match them, many of them don't get through that, and then to listen to them, and I lose a lot of them when I listen to them, because any 70-year-old uh, any 70 year old tube that's high gain is going to have a very high failure rate electrically, and it's going to have a very high failure rate when I actually listen for noise, and it's because of the gain. The, the noise floor automatically goes up, so if you had a tube with um, a gain of, let's say, 10, which is a very low mu, uh, and a, a tube like the 6SL7, which has a gain of 70, you have, automatically, you have seven times the noise floor. So that explains a lot why we, we have problems uh, with these tubes getting noisy. They just have so much gain. If they have a little bit of noise in the circuit, they're amplifying it. Okay, what else came in? Let's put that aside. Oh, have a look at these. These are more lovely um, EL34s. They've got an old brown base, sort of like a Svetlana. But have a look at the top. I don't know if you can get it on camera. I think we've got it. You see those angled, sort of overlapped halo getters, the pair? That tells you that this is an original Tesla made in the first factory. They actually moved and then things changed and it's it's actually not an easy tube to stock because there's so many different variations on the tube over the decades. This is a wonderful sounding tube and um, a lot of people really like the bass that comes off of this. And it's it's not a th you know thump a thump a thump a bass. It's just it's just a really nice detailed present bass that's it might be slightly forward but it sounds really good the problem with Tesla's is that matching up quads of these old tubes these vintage tubes is really tricky with all those variations that means that you need a large inventory of the better tubes they had a very high failure rate among the EL 34s um, I, I have more failures than the Tesla's than anything else and once they're tested and once they're listened to, that failure rate is stable. They seem to be fine. It's just getting a tube made in the 1960s that's now, what, is 60 years, could be a 60-year-old tube, getting, getting them to the point where they, I have a match quad that's testing good electrically 
and sounds good, that's nice and quiet, that's the tricky part. Once we weed out all the bad tubes that didn't make it to this stage, this, the quads tend to be stable and they, they tend to sound really good for a long time, at least based on my failure rate and return rate. Okay, what's, what's left? Oh yeah, I saved, I always save the best, I always save the best to last. These are in bulk sleeves. But have a look at this. We were just talking about them. Can you imagine? Now we don't have a date on the bulk sleeve, but we can well imagine that this is probably pre-1950, and there's no date on the, the actual tube, unfortunately. But these are more of the Sylvania mil-spec tubes. So, new old stock, new in the sleeve, or at least the bulk carton sleeve, and 70 years old, give or take, and I'm still able to find them. Now, I, I'm not finding these in case lots. God, I wish I could find them in case lots, but I find them in fours and pairs. Sometimes I get lucky and I find six or 12 of them, which is explains why they're so bloody expensive. With all of the tubes that don't, that don't pass muster, um, I, I would say actually that more than half the tubes I buy actually end up in the garbage. Isn't that a shame? But it's just the reality. It's the way it is. Nobody wants a noisy tube in their system, and nobody wants a grossly mismatched tube in their system. They just don't work. Okay, <laughs> if you stay till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if you pay for tracking, I recommend, if you've got a big order, I recommend you pay the premium and pay for tracking. Free shipping does not include tracking. I just, it's not possible to afford it. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Okay, everyone, take care. Stay safe. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.